Good morning. I too am so honored to join this uh, amazing catalytic conversation. Um, and thanks particularly to Dr. Mitchell for giving us this opportunity. Uh, I am Kate McAvoy, and if I can have the next slide, please. I'm a program officer at the Millbank Memorial Fund. Millbank Memorial has been in existence for over 100 years. It's a population health foundation, and its hallmark is working with state executive branch leaders as well as policymakers to connect connect those leaders with uh, evidence to enable them to make sound policy decisions. And more recently, we have been working to elevate the level of priority and urgency around healthy aging. If I may have the next slide, please. I was so struck uh, by the uh, not only the expertise that was represented yesterday in the discussions, but also the personal testimonials. This is uh, essential facets of this issue is that it is by its nature affecting people in very intimate and emotional ways. And I think what yesterday illustrated is that there is a remarkable consensus around what we want for people that is not necessarily yet manifest. And some of those attributes uh, include a really applied attention to person-centeredness, uh, braiding that with uh, supports that are uh, fair and equitable, uh, also supported by technology, but continue to emphasize the, the value of human touch and connection. Um, and I think that consistently emerges as a set of values. Um, I would posit that um, it would be useful for us to focus uh, on a number of things. First, uh, coordinating available resources and supports, particularly for middle and low-income folks, um, taking aside the small slice of folks who can underwrite the, their, their own costs of long-term care, a very small segment, and those who are insured through long-term care insurance. And I think to do so, it really requires uh, a synthesis of existing strands of both planning and strategic work and also available uh, funding streams. May I have the next slide? There are a significant number of positive features of the environment, and fellow speakers are addressing this in more detail and have yesterday. But I think the federal leadership around strategic direction and emerging state-level coordination, some uh, examples of this include the master plan on aging approach, the longstanding Older Americans Act requirement for state plans on aging, and then the state Alzheimer's disease plans. And I think there's important connective tissue as between the federal and state levels there that is uh, very important, again, to elevate uh, the prioritization of the SHISU for governors. Uh, also, there's been a lot of attention to means of conveying and supporting consumers uh, with information uh, around uh, aging and disability resource centers and the so-called no wrong door approach, which uh, examines uh, various intersection points across communities and uh, trusted sources. There is some funding available, and I'm acutely conscious of particularly Dr. Vladek's comments yesterday around the constraints here, but Medicaid waiver supports and the existing uh, uh, low level, but uh, uh, some resources for the Older Americans Act, National Family Caregiver, emerging evidence base that was discussed in detail yesterday, and of course, advancement of technology. So that said, if I may have the next slide, there are uh, some real challenges, um, and many of those have been discussed, um, just kind of pulling some of those strands together. The federal and state uh, planning and strategic direction seems to me to uh, be uh, very uh, 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 effective, but often siloed, uh, not integrating various facets of particularly the federal policy direction. And a key example is that Medicaid and Older Americans Act activities um, jointly uh, managed by CMS and the Administration for Community Living don't tend to intersect as much as would be optimal. Um, a longstanding challenge for all of us is that consumers uh, are very poorly informed despite a lot of effort and work in this area. Uh, and those information sources to which I referred just a moment ago tend to remain underutilized until a point of crisis, um, a fall or an episode of hospitalization. And there remain, uh, as was discussed by the payment panel yesterday, serious constraints on paying for needed services, uh, that we don't have an organized uh, public means of long-term care insurance, and the private market has essentially languished. Uh, there's a very high variability in the extent to which Medicaid waiver services 
services are available for people with dementia. Um, this is a great disappointment to me. I am a former Medicaid director and I oversaw long-term services and supports at the state level. And that um, uh, truth around where you are situated determining your access to services remains a, a really uh, acute problem. Um, and then the modest funding for Older Americans Act, um, again, is a constraint. If I may have the next slide. Um, you know, in context of those uh, kind of conducive features, but also uh, the challenges, um, I offered uh, three recommendations today. First is for uh, facets of more uh, extensive communication and coordination between uh, the CMS and the ACL. Um, again, around that sort of literacy issues, uh, taking into account the typical pathways that consumers do find trustworthy, peers and physicians, and to do that on a constant and continual basis so that it's situationally available when they need it. Um, I think it would be terrific if CMS could endorse more Medicaid underwriting of the Aging and Disability Resource Center approach and various services that can keep people independent at home, um, home adaptation, uh, ERS, and telemonitoring. And then I would love to see a, uh, an approach that essentially synthesized uh, planning uh, for spending down to Medicaid eligibility for people who have too many resources to qualify currently. If I have me have the next slide, another recommendation is that we should not give up the ghost on a publicly uh, funded uh, scheme for long-term care insurance, a payroll-based piece. I think this would have amazing uh, benefit for defraying the catastrophic costs, uh, out-of-pocket costs of dementia, but also uh, as a consumer literacy vehicle that would be rooted in the work in the workplace. And finally, and probably most significant for me, again, if we look at the next slide, uh, I'm, uh, you know, hear the comments about constraints of the financing panel yesterday ringing in my ears. But I'm a strong believer that uh, that Medicaid could uh, be enabled to do significantly more here. Uh, I'd like to see an 1115 uh, waiver opportunity for duels that had as a particular uh, point of emphasis uh, coordinated uh, care payments uh, that would capitalize the work of supporting people more effectively with that type of intervention, equity measures, person-driven uh, outcome measures, and other features of financial risk. I'd also love to see uh, Congress implement the recommendations that were proposed in Build Back Better around shifting the statutory presumption in Medicaid from institutional settings to the community, making permanent the enhanced match for home and community-based services, uh, at long last, making permanent the money follows the person demonstration, and then also the Medicaid rules that are facilitated for spouses. Finally, um, we should see many more protections and attention, uh, rigor around uh, the access and utilization of benefits under Medicare Advantage plans. And again, taken together, I think these features could improve on some of those constraints that we uh, see uh, very much in evidence now. Thank you so much.